Welcome to Evangelicalish, where we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the American Evangelical Church, deconstruction, faith, and God's love through it all. Join us for these episodes live on our Evangelicalish YouTube page on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central, and 6 o'clock Pacific. Let's journey together. Welcome into the Evangelicalish podcast. It is another live Wednesday night. We are glad that you are joining us this evening. I'm Jeremy. I'm April. And I'm Paul. And we are really excited uh, about our guests tonight. Um, you know, April and I certainly both uh, kind of growing up in this, uh, in that 90s, early 2000s era of uh, youth ministry and all of those things. We're super excited about it. So uh, a lot of y'all have probably seen the promo. If you haven't, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Uh, I get so it. You're saying I'm old. I get it. <laughs> you just had mentioned, I, I didn't want to throw you under the bus by any stretch. You had just mentioned that was kind of after your time in some of the more, mm -hmm. you know, contemporary stuff. Paul, like, was, I, mo Paul was more into Carmen. He's more seasoned. Yeah, the Paul, Imperials and Carmen were more Paul's my more youth seasoned. Group. He's aged like wine. We we love Paul. It's it's all good things. Okay. We didn't have that evil Christian rock when I was a kid. All right. I'm going to I'm just going to I'm going to step over that comment and not get distracted. No squirrels today. Um anyway, uh so we're super glad that you're joining us for the podcast. Um couple of things real quick. Uh, we are going to be in Nashville in just a couple of weeks. It is really exciting. Saturday, October 1st at the Lipstick Lounge there in Nashville, Tennessee. What? Um, and uh, we're going to be there. We're going to do a live show, uh, have drinks with you, do some karaoke. It's going to be a blast. You're definitely going to want to come and be a part of that. I know we've got a bunch of folks who have already signed up, but we want a bunch more. We want to meet you. So here's the thing. It's absolutely free. Just just sign up now. You want to leave us a tip or, you know, kind of help the help the team cover some of the costs of, you know, venue and travel and all of that kind of stuff. We would greatly appreciate it, but it is not expected or required. So we would love just to meet you and put faces with these comments. And uh, you can and stick around week. at the end for some karaoke. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mentioned that for sure. And uh, we're all going to get up and do some karaoke, uh, the three of us for sure. And and I'm sure a lot of y'all. So we're going to have a good time. I'm going to I'm going to drink plenty of whiskey. So my karaoke is going to go great um, one way or the other, whether it's actually good or not. And uh, so it's going to be it's going to be fantastic time. And if you haven't already, uh, you should definitely join the evangelicalish community. Um, come be uh, end of days villain. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, and so we need to put is... an asterisk that we're not actually end of days villains because I do think people might take it a little seriously. If they take it seriously, then they don't know us, and they're probably not going <laughs> to join. I feel like that's a, like a really useless disclaimer. <laughs> Um, so by the way, we need people need to go to evangelicalish.com to mm -hmm. sign up for either of the things you've mentioned. That's our new website. Yeah. Evangelicalish.com. And, and let me kind of explain. So the evangelicalish community, cause I've had several people ask about it. It is similar to like, if we had set up a Patreon or something like that. So there's going to be, uh, you're not just giving money to give money. This is not, uh, the church whoops. Um, this is, this is, you will get things in return. So, uh, there's going to be, uh, some opportunities to connect with us. Um, and and uh and and private chat boards as well as private episodes of the show and some zoom meetings and things like that so you're definitely going to want to be a part of it uh there's levels for everybody so you know if you're like man guys i i want to support you but i just i'm not really in a great financial place right now there's there's stuff on the on the cheaper end there's stuff on the on the higher end it, there's comfort levels for everybody so we would really appreciate it if you join the evangelicalist community like i said there's there's tons of great behind the scenes content for you uh that you'll get in return and uh and and you'll get our undying affection and love so, undying 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 uh, <laughs> Not to be confused with the undying land. Hey, I'm the one that's doing well, Jay Not. Thank you very much. I have walked past like at least six squirrels that I could have taken already tonight. We'll see. How By the way, I like I like Jenny's squirrel there that the lipstick lounge where we're having the live event, one of only 21 lesbian owned bars in all of America. And that's where we're holding our first event. I love it. I'm it's pretty excited fitting. about it. It's going to be great. Um, I will also be in, in uh, well, I'll be in the Nashville area. I'll be in Columbia, Tennessee the weekend before. Uh, and so that'll be fun. Um, Tennessee. Gonna, 
Yeah. We're going to we're we're going to be mean about the things happening in Tennessee. No, we're not going to be mean, but we're going to speak out against uh, some issues with the libraries and things going on down there. So it's going to be great. So uh, if you're anywhere in the area, I'd love to meet you and hang out with you two weekends in a row. It'll be great. It will be great. Now, without further ado, do I even I don't even know if I really need to introduce this person, because yeah, if you were a 90s kid in youth group or the in the 2000s. You knew who this, who Kevin Max was, who is now here from DC Talk. Yay! Who has done two decades plus worth of music since then? We yeah. need to acknowledge that. And I, I personally believe that you've only gotten better with time. So, Kevin Max, everybody, welcome to Evangelicalish. Woo! Good to see you, Kevin. Uh, it's lovely to be seen. <laughs> seen well, and heard <laughs> yeah absolutely so i mean we're we're super excited i i think um mm -hmm. you know i i think the thing that i was most excited about when uh we heard that april had talked to you about coming on the show is um it makes me feel even less lonely as somebody who kind of grew up in that same era and has walked through a faith journey of you know deconstruction evangelicalism, those kinds of things um you know, kind of, I'm interested off the bat, kind of where did that, where did that process start for you? And and I think I'm really interested of when you kind of announced that to the world, kind of the backlash you got maybe even behind the scenes, but what was that, what was kind of that faith journey for like for you? I would say early on, uh, as early as like, you know, probably my late teenage years, I was interested in all sorts of expressions uh, from poetry to science fiction to fantasy. Um, I was the kid that, that read Frank Herbert's Dune um, and Anne Rice, the vampire Lestat, and, um, you know, basically um, tried to, uh, for better or for worse, memorize lots of poems so that I could seem pseudo intellectual um, when I met people. So I've always pushed uh, my intellect with reading and, and I feel like I was never really into things that people would, you know, ask you to read growing up in a Christian school or, or a church. I would, I would tell them what they, they'd ask me what I was reading and I'd tell them Stephen King and they'd all, you know, run away scared of me and so <laughs> Gas. it started early for me just just from you know reading and and getting into music i was i was really influenced by british new wave um i oh. listened to the smiths and i went to a christian high school and everybody was listening to like uh, i don't know like amy grant or brian duncan i guess and i was <laughs> I was listening to The Fix and The Cure. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was wearing makeup and I tried to look like Duran Duran every day. And um, you were listening to Amy Grant until she went secular. And then you secular. couldn't listen to her anymore. <laughs> uh, I met Amy early on in, in, in our career. And I just think she's the most wonderful, fascinating person. Uh, mm -hmm. I got to sing with her and Vince Gill, actually, on a record that I did many many years ago uh, wow. called blood and they came in and and uh performed with me on a track and it was amazing just to see them interact as a couple and then also you know i was just a huge i, I was i was a you know new wave nerd so i didn't know anything about vid skill and you know yeah. uh my friend that was producing the record said man vin skill's an amazing guitar player and i'm like really i said you know Hey Vince, could you play guitar for me on this track so I can hear, you know, how you would interpret this? And he ended up playing the most insane, you know, rockabilly line I've ever heard, and and just blew me away. An incredible musician. So um, I know I'm off off uh, subject there. No, it's super cool. Um, I'd say early on, and it and it really wasn't until. I'd say midway through my first couple of solo albums that I started to kind of throw out my ideas and throw out my poetry and, and be kind of, you know, um, I was extremely, uh, uh, I've always been outspoken, but I started to, to gather some uh, authority in what I was doing and, and some, and some confidence. Mm -hmm. 
And by the third record, I kind of was letting people know uh, things about my my spiritual journey and my process and whatever. Um, but uh, it wasn't until I'd say about 2016, 2017, that I started really talking about my deconstruction. I made an album called Radio Technica, which is a spoken word record, and it was kind of my protest record of 2019. Nice. And I wrote a song called, you know, Jesus, I love you, but or Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, I love you, but your followers freak me out. Um, yes. There were a couple of uh, other, you know, songs talking about um, the, the, the Trump's uh, running for office. And I, th it was the first time that I actually really got kind of political slash, uh, you know, specifically talking about my spiritual journey. Um, on a record and uh, because i guess for, for, for the most part for many many years i've been kind of abstract i like abstract art i mm -hmm. appreciate poetry even more than music so i like to speak in poems more than i do even in musical lyric and so just recently on my instagram i started throwing out some poems that i'd written and people are like wow he writes poetry too the one that you posted on um monday of this week what was it? There was one line that really stood out to me. Can I read it? Is that weird if I read it? Um, where you were saying the Jesus you project upon me is weeping for you. That like, I don't know, that really struck a chord with me. I feel like anyone that's been deconstructing or as an ex-evangelical who came from those Christian circles, it's like we're constantly being demonized now when in reality I, I mean I can't speak for everyone but I feel more at free like more at peace and more freedom than previously absolutely I mean you know my first podcast ever um during this time period was with Trip Fuller and he called me a gothic hippie socialist Jesus freak or something like that and so you, you and I I was calling myself that online just as a kind of a joke but I mean, everybody loves to throw these uh, these these titles on people and these, uh, and I, the deconstruction thing still kind of weirds me out because I've been going through this for so long that I just see it as a part of my process, and yeah. I don't think it's ever going to stop. It's you know, it's going to continue to you know progress into different things. I mean, my favorite deconstruction author uh, is Shel John Shelby Spong who, um, you know, his big quote was, you know, I surrendered to the mystery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's been kind of my, you know, almost like my, uh, my phrase to myself all the time. It's, it's okay to surrender to the mystery of it all. Yeah. You don't have to have the answers. It's, it's better to wonder at it and, and be like a come, come at the whole thing. I'm, I'm talking about death, uh, the universe out there that we can't see. Um, the supernatural, all these things coming at it fr at, at, from the angle of the one of wonder, like a child, um, I think is, is very, um, it's, it's therapeutic for me. I don't try to get caught up in, you know, drama most of the time, cause I've already got a lot of anxiety in my life. So, mm. uh, I, but I have been a whipping boy for many evangelicals. You know, um, <laughs> that we love to yeah. see it. That was kind of my question, though. No, we don't love to see it because because that just means evangelicals are still being evil bastards. Well, is what that yeah, means. but it's also just so, nice to punch back uh, sometimes. <laughs> no, yeah, it is good to punch back. I, I, I do you wanna... say these things to me in 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 person because um, I I have been known to fight in my past, and I, you know if somebody said this, to my past, <laughs> I would I, I, I would easily take them down, and so it's kind of like you know I don't. I try not to get angry online because it doesn't serve really any purpose. Um, but I have been known to be a little sarcastic and, and, a, and a little have a little fun with it all. You know, I, I think, we, you know, we've we've all lost friends, relationships, uh, have people questioning us as we kind of publicly do do our thing. But to be so well known and, and I went and watched some YouTube videos about your Exvangelicalism and people weren't always kind about you. How was it to do it as such a public figure? It had to be particularly challenging, perhaps. Well, what's interesting I is I didn't do any podcasts, um, you know, up until probably like 
middle of of maybe the end of last year. I didn't do any podcast around the time that um, that all this kind of blew up. And it was it was on Twitter. I just said, hey, I'm an evangelical too. We're all going through this, you know, and it was like, um, you know, all of these podcast people talking about, you know, my faith, my spirituality with, without having ever talked to me personally mm -hmm. yeah. and going off of like one tweet that wasn't even a full uh, yeah. sentence really. Uh, just showed me that people were drawing their own conclusions about me and writing their own synopsis about me without even speaking to me. I mean, Trip Fuller, uh, Mason Menenga, and you guys are the really the only people that I've done podcasts with since you know since talking about that online. So I find it really interesting that these people can go on for 40, 50 minutes without me being there yeah. about, about my life. It's just yeah. insane. I well, think. and and that's exactly, you know, very similar to what we've found is, you know, I mean, we've all been targets of, uh, uh, you know, the occasional bigger name. I know, you know, April has fallen into the crosshairs of Ben Shapiro and uh, I've fallen into John Cooper's crosshairs. You know, I mean, these things, these things happen. I can't imagine. And, and that was exactly what I was wondering, Paul. That's a great question is, you know, what it, what is it like kind of like even do you have some people who you've been around in the industry for a long time who are, you know, saying things about you publicly at this point that it's like, dude, just come have a conversation with me. Like, this is ridiculous. Again, I think I like to, um, you know, bask in the mystery of it all. <laughs> I, if somebody wants to come and talk to me, I would, I would enjoy that um, to debate about, where I'm at in my spiritual process online just doesn't interest me at all. No. And, and I don't necessarily mean debate. Yeah, I know, you didn't mean that. I, I guess um, if somebody was to say, Hey, I'd really like to have a conversation with you. I'd say, let's not do it online. Let's um, right. Let's grab a coffee somewhere. Let's uh, let's grab a drink somewhere. You know, uh, you know, I like scotch. I like wine. I like coffee. Um, I even, you know, drink uh those fizzy waters sometimes you know <laughs> i mean you know i would just rather speak to somebody in person yes like this we're on a podcast where we're looking at each other's faces and we're talking i mean rather than somebody you know going on on, on you know some long you know written thing that has nothing to do with me but they're trying to sell a book or they're trying to yeah. you know get get more likes or it's it's basically clickbait for a lot of people so yeah. i've tried not to you know with folks like that i try not to uh, get involved online but you know hey if i saw these people in person absolutely if i recognized one of these podcasters i'd be like hey let's have a let's have a conversation now you know um but uh, I guess I'm kind of over it too. I've 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 moved on. I mean, I'm, Fair. I'm you know I'm more interested in, in making music and 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 making art than I am trying to discuss where I'm at in, in my spiritual process. It seems so boring. I, mean, I think when you're a public figure too, people have this entitlement where they feel like you owe them an explanation of where you are on all things, and mm -hmm. you don't owe anybody. Anything. As an artist, you really don't. I mean, I mean, I, my, my favorites are abstract artists, you know, and if you're on my Twitter feed at all, anytime, you'll see me posting anybody from, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat to, you know, uh, I'll do a Picasso once in a while. I'll do a Rothko. I'll do I'll do lots of different people because I'm interested in abstract art. I'm also interested in poetry, so maybe I'll throw up a Charles Bukowski poem or an E. e. Cummings poem or, yeah. or an Emily Dick Dickinson poem. I'm more interested in, in that than discussing okay. what somebody thinks about somebody's spiritual process. And I know that goes against what kind of what, what we're doing here, but maybe maybe not. I don't know. I mean, you know, I do like how you know April has really told stories of the human condition and got people to laugh and you know she's made some really great points about where we're at in this in this world in 2022 and 
I have four kids. I have three teenagers that wow. you know, going through these crazy changes and um, I can't even understand their, their, their culture. You know, they're being brought up on TikTok. And, you know, when I was a kid, I had a motorcycle, a horse, some, a forest and uh, some books. I had four channels on a TV. I had to sneak downstairs to watch Friday night videos. And that was before, <laughs> that was before MTV. So I'm just kind of like this weird fossil that is trying to understand all of this. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd, ra I'd rather write a poem um, than uh, talk about do I believe in this or that. I mean, I do think that the... I think the universe is much larger than we can even comprehend. Uh, mm -hmm. I do this supernatural realm. I believe in aliens. Uh, I believe in a lot of things, but do I, I'm not a, 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 a I'm not a scholar on any of them. So I just kind of keep to myself. I, what I, I think, I think what we try to do and what's a value. And it seems like when people reflect back to us, what they value about the podcast is, and, and what has been a value to me to get to know people like April and Jeremy through social media is to know yeah. I'm not alone on this journey. Yes, and and so actually, I don't think any of us are are brilliant theologians, but we're just people saying, "Hey, we were very indoctrinated evangelicals, and we're journeying out." And and so I think where your voice is so powerful and important and helpful and uh, is is again as somebody who was known in that evangelical realm to see your journey and and to know that it had to cost you. So what was it that sort of started the process for you? And what was kind of the kind of the breaking point where you decided, okay, it's time for me to tweet. I'm I'm an ex-evangelical. Um, I think it was just I had seen a lot of people using the catchphrase and and um I want to say uh, his name is Blake Blake Chastain. Yes, he he came up with the term ex-evangelical. Came up with the term, and I I was following him, and I, I I thought a lot of his tweets were were wonderful, and so I was like, you know, I I'm agreeing with ninety eight percent of what he's saying. I must be an ex-evangelical too, you know, and so I think that I said it out of camaraderie to people that were out there, you know, in each other's feeds whatever. But I also think uh, maybe I just kind of, you know, I probably had a couple of glasses of wine with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, fuck it. I'm doing it. That's as good a reason as any right there. I was watching probably some bad, you know, rom-com with her and trying to find a way out, you know. To... <laughs> yes, we know Sheldon drama. Cooper. Yeah. Did you yeah. expect it to blow up like it did and get that kind of reaction? I still don't even know how much it blew up. Like people are still kind of like letting me know. It, I, people still tell me that I'm kind of a big deal and I don't believe them. I'm kind of <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm just a singer. I mean, if people, if people were to look at my, uh, a, lot, a lot of times my bios are pretty funny, but sometimes I just scale it back to the minimalist, uh, you know, just a singer because in reality, that's what I am. I'm a singer. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a theologian. Uh, you know, I've written books, but I don't consider myself like really an author. Um, I, I'm, I, can, I do consider myself a poet because I love the art and I've been writing poetry for a long time. I've got two published books of poetry out there, if that sounds, um, you know, worthy of a, of a guest on your show. Um, yes. Sorry. There I am. <laughs> there you are. You look good. You. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm basking in the light of my computer. Sorry, everybody. When I turn on the lights sure. in my studio at night, I, I start to shrink uh, or, or my face starts to melt. It's so weird. <laughs> uh, I so, you, you know, I, I think you bring up some great points, you know, that uh, it, I, I think, so I was having a conversation with uh, the, the worship pastor that I work with now and, um, you know, a lot of people have come to our church and they're like, oh, the worship pastor is a lesbian. And they're so excited about that. And the, and the phrase that she keeps giving them is that's not the most interesting thing about me. That's what she says to them. That's not the most interesting thing about me. She's like, I, 
I, I really enjoy, you know, going out on my boat and wakeboarding and like, you know, like all these other things, right? Like, um, I, I love kind of what you're saying here about like, yeah, I'm on a spiritual journey just like the rest of us, but that's not the most interesting thing about me. Out of that, I kind of get curious um, because I've, I've enjoyed kind of watching your progression as an artist. Um, and, and again, kind of, kind of going through that deconstruction process with you. Here's my question. What is, what is inspiring you? Like, I know you're working on a new album. Uh, the Kickstarter is out by the way, if you haven't folks who are out there listening, go, uh, donate, uh, to Kevin's Kickstarter for, uh, his new project that's getting ready to come out. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, what's, what are the big things inspiring your work right now? Anybody that really knows me knows that I haven't stopped making records. Um, it just seems like Kickstarter now is a way to engage with fans and, yeah. and followers and supporters um, in a really great way. I'm also on Patreon, so I'm, I'm interested in that, um, you know, model as well. But um, to be honest, you know, I've been making records since 2000. And um, I even when I was in that first band of DC Talk, I, I was doing music on the side. Um, I put out a poetry book in 1994 with Jimmy Abeg. Um, he painted to the uh, to my poetry. A really good friend of ours named Buddy Jackson put together the arranged book, and um, it was kind of like my first album before music. I had all these ideas, and I throw the, I threw them in the poetry. Mm -hmm. So I've since 2000, I've been making records, and I'm honestly with Winter Woods, the Christmas Project, and then Fantasy, which is downloading for people immediately. I'm, I'm on my 20th album, um, wow. just like about an album a year. Um, but sometimes it's two or three albums in a year and it, I'm insatiable. Mm. I'm insatiable. I, I, I need to create, um, you know, a lot of people have said he's like a mad scientist and it's true. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not happy unless I'm creating. And so I think that's where I'm at. Um, creativity fuels me. Uh, if a conversation mm. can be creative, then that fuels me. I mean, Trip Fuller and I had a great conversation about Lord of the Rings the other night on Tolkien heads because I'm obsessed with Tolkien, you know? And I think April and I have something in common where I was just like, you know, what about the orcs? You know, yes. I, I want to know the orc lifestyle. I'm, I'm tired of the orcs just being this obvious black and white scenario. Like what about the orc that dissents and decides not to go to war? Mm hmm. And he's just kind of at home or she's just at home. Can you can you tell them all the wonderful pun you came up with for the musical? Orchestration. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed way too hard at that. I just feel like the, even the fan the, the ma massive fantasy stories of George R. R. Martin or Frank Herbert or Tolkien, it the the good versus evil is just so obvious. And I feel like sometimes it's great to see somebody on the spectrum that might mm -hmm. might be a little bit of both i think that was the beauty of what we saw in in hamilton right um was this really great story arc of nobody was really like it would be really er e easy to make hamilton the hero and, and burr the the villain in that but we saw kind of this give and take of good and bad from both of them through the entire context and I, I do agree with you there. There's something beautiful about writing characters who are not monoliths and things aren't just so black and white. I, I think that's I think that's a great point. Monolith. Great word. Large stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, hey, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, nothing. I was. Oh. Gonna I was, was going to say, like, I was a, I was a Smith. Monolithic. My yeah, I, I, I was a Smith's and, and Cure guy back in the day, too. And, and I'm really bummed that Morrissey has gone kind of crazy uh, right winger. So crazy. Isn't that crazy? That, He's always been crazy. Yeah. I feel like Morrissey is massively misunderstood, though. I feel like he says things that gets himself in trouble quite a bit. I mean, he's made a whole li life on that. He's, his lyrical... Um, you know, it's testament to all the, the, the things that he's done through time. Lyrically, I would put him on the same page as Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen. Definitely. One Definitely. of the best lyricists in rock and roll, period. And so 
anybody to be that good, you've got to be a little crazy. Mm. Yeah. Mm, true. I love I love the first song that I really learned to sing in my car going to high school was Meat is Murder. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I was singing these songs about uh, veganism before I even understood what that was. <laughs> well, it, and, it, and it was, it, the thing is, you know, he's writing songs about, you know, these love songs that talk about if I get, if we get hit by a 10 ton truck and die, you know, what a great love story we're going to have, you know, and, and Christian music was, I'm sorry, just shitty when I was a kid, you know, and, and <laughs> Yeah. Are, do you feel you have a freedom outside of that space that you didn't have back in the day when you were when your audience was more evangelical? Beware, I bear more grudges than lonely high court judges. Um, <laughs> and it's those kind of lines. I absolutely yeah. loved him for. Um, can you ask me the last question again, sir? Like, like, uh, do you do you feel like you have more freedom to express who you are, what's inside of you, than than when you were in uh, in the evangelical Christian audience space, in my first band, absolutely. Yeah. In my first band, I was a singer. Mm. And I was young, and um, it was um, one of the other guys in the band's vision. And so I just kind of, you know, I was along for the ride, really. But um, you know, absolutely. Now, uh, you know, I I feel completely free. Mm. To I want any old time. Um, and I, and I love, I, you know, I love the venue. I, I love the vehicle of music. Yeah. It's literally the universal language. And I feel like there's so much more that can be done with music even now. You know, when I first heard Billie Eilish and I saw what she was doing, I'm like, yes. I mean, somebody's kind of recreating something again. Mm -hmm. like there's a million Billie Eilishes ready to happen, you know, um, we're, we just, you know, time as time progresses, we'll see it. You know what I mean? And it's, it's cyclical music. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that actually probably answers w what I was thinking of. And, you know, my next question, I love to ask artists, you know, who is somebody you listen to that the rest of us may not have heard of that we need to hear? Uh, and who is somebody mainstream that you just really respect their craft? And so, I mean, is Billy somebody that you're just like, you, you love the craft? No, I just think that she was you know, someone that, you know, created uh, an art form um, that was very peculiar. It was different. It hadn't been heard much before. Um, you know, she definitely followed some of the same formulas as, as a lot of the pop artists do, but she did it in a different way. Um, I think there's a lot of, I mean, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I would love your listeners to go check out Scott Walker um, and put on um, a Scott Walker album, Drift, Fish Bosch and try to sit with that with a nice glass of wine. That mm -hmm. is avant-garde. That is different. That's something you'll never hear anything like it again. And Scott Walker um, largely influenced David Bowie, who I, I consider one of, you know, one of the most interesting artists of all time, um, mainly because he had so many great ideas and he was free with himself to experiment and he did not care if his music made it to the radio. Um, mm. Now at a certain point he probably did when he first started out, but um, you know, I just feel like when you, when you, when you don't take a risk, when you're not pushing yourself as far as you possibly can go mm. and you're, you're not out of your comfort zone, it's going to be boring. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry. No, you're fine. No, that's great. Right. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, were you surprised? This is changing topics a little bit. Okay. Just I want your personal opinion on this. Were you surprised at how so many evangelicals threw their hat in for Trump? Or did you see the writing on the wall? I mean... Humanity continues to be, um, you know, s s sadly, um, you know, they, humanity lets me down all the time. So I guess that this is this was 
definitely foreseeable. Um, I yeah. feel like, you know, when he started running, I thought it was really strange. Um, you know, he's basically a businessman gone talk show host. And like, I don't, I, you know, I don't really see that kind of a person being a president, but, you know, but then of course, all of the things that he stood for and all the things that he, you know, was known for, you know, um, when it all came to life, that didn't surprise me either. Um, I think for me, it was just kind of like, you know, it, it is amazing that so many people within the evangelical structure would hoodwinked by him and yeah. continue to be like he's their friend when, you know, right. We all know that he looks at them like rubes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I, f I feel like when, uh, I mean, I was still evangelical in 2016, I would have said that I was just because they weren't like, they didn't seem as problematic. They were, but I just hadn't seen it yet. But I feel like as the closer they all got to Trump, the further I was like, I don't, I can't, I cannot associate with this. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. So I didn't know if that was the, something the you felt too. Yeah, I think the problem with the, the political system in America is that, it, you know, largely down to two people, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, you know, if it's not one person, it's another person. And, and, and a lot of times both of the idea, both of the choices are not great. And so I know that's kind of like a way out for some people mm -hmm. when the conversation happens. But I'm just, you know, I'll go on record and say I think Obama was amazing. Um, I think he was a great leader. I think he was a great president. Um, but there's not been a lot that I look at and go, that person was made to be a president. Um, I think yeah. our political structure is screwed up. Yeah. You know, it's, it, totally. I, I want to live in France. <laughs> I'm actually, I might be moving to France soon. <laughs> wow. It, was like I, a, it sounds like a jest, but it's for real. My wife and I have been looking at property and, and um, you know, it's not that I want to only live there for the rest of my life, but. I want to go someplace that's just like not like it is here, I guess. Fair. No. As a I, I was looking at you yeah. like Italy is paying people to move to Italy. <laughs> but then I was reading and you have to be like 40 or below. They want young people to move to Italy. So I guess I'm disqualified. But oh, no. on an Ageism. unrelated note. Ageism. Ageist. <laughs> Right, on no. an unrelated note, my wife and I are moving to Italy is what I just heard. By, by the way, they they will. They'll pay you $33,000 to to move to Italy as long as you agree. To, and they'll give you a house. They'll um, give you a house? They'll give you a house? They'll give you a house. But you have to move to these villages because the, all the young people are moving to the cities. And so they're, they're trying to incent young people to move back to these villages that have been I think uh, Italy is is amazing like they understand um beauty mm -hmm. I don't you know obviously they've got great food they've got great music they've got great art but I feel like they're the kind of culture that just doesn't like hang all day on how much dough I've got to make or yeah you know, who's going to love me who's going who, who's going to <laughs> like you know like my song or my stream or my podcast you know i think they're 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 into better things they're they're trying to figure out how to perfect pasta or something it's um <laughs> or uh you know walk around the fountain to enjoy you know architecture i mean it's it's um i think the americans are so insular we're mm -hmm. and we're so narcissistic and we're so entitled and, and we're so boring i mean i'm just like yeah. you know not you guys. You guys have been amazing. <laughs> so you're telling us no, you're boring. But, but, but in general, in general, uh, Americans are boring uh, because because of the rat race culture that has been created here in the United States. I mean, it is all about earn as much money as possible, live fast, you know, as hard as and fast as you can. And um, and I, I think there's just a real lack of I, I like what you said earlier about Italians do a good job of uh you know, appreciating beauty and, and seeing beauty. I think that's something that we just, we don't even slow down long enough mm -hmm. to appreciate anything. Well, even the uh, South America, some of the South American countries and, and the ideas around siesta and, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, I, I go to Brazil um, every other year to do shows and Brazilians really understand 
relaxing during the day. Uh, mm. They don't work nine hour shifts. They don't, mm. and then when they get home, they're not pouring over their work even before they go to sleep. They're yeah. interested in living life, you know, and um, mm -hmm. there's some great things about America there, there, that, there, you know, there's something about America that is beautiful. Um, and I love this Matthew McConaughey thing that I watched where he was talking about how America still ha hasn't even realized itself yet. And mm -hmm. it's become the country that it, 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 it's wanted to be from the very beginning. Um, and maybe in 20 years from now, America will truly be a great place to be. But mm -hmm. right now, because of our division and because of our, um, you know, our, our, our insanity around constant work, constant money, constant power struggles, um, you know, wanting to be the authority in everything, wanting to be loved by everyone to the point where we're distorting our images, um, you know. And I'm not even talking about filters. I'm talking mm. about people going out and, you know, whatever, changing the way they look because they they're they're feeling the the, the constant judgment. You know, I can't imagine a, being a kid today, yeah. uh, being the nerd that I was growing up, and and then being in the society now. I mean, the the constant, you know, like uh, having to live up to some unattainable thing is yeah crazy my I, my daughter's a creative and wants to be a broadway actress and uh and and she she definitely will i think move to europe one day and she's constantly saying to us america just doesn't understand the value of art and and in europe they're much more you know in america it's the suffering wait waiter waitress trying to get there. And in Europe, they provide ways for creative people to live while honing their craft. And so definitely she's on board and hearing what you're saying and that there's a value for creativity that exists mm -hmm. around the world that our capitalist system doesn't provide room for. I also think we're celebrity obsessed. Yeah. We're, we're, we're yes. a celebrity driven culture. And, you know, I just feel like there's so many artists that have never been known by people that are doing incredible work that, you know, over in other countries, they get noticed, you know, mm -hmm. but in America, they don't because they're, they're not savvy enough to, you know, get the right sponsor. Or get. <laughs> it's, it's why Russell Crowe ends up playing Javert in the Les Mis movie when, hello folks, he cannot sing. The, the man <laughs> cannot sing, but He's Russell Crowe. So. He, he, he's, he's been an, a, like a, a, a decent actor in one movie. Gladiator was good. And then after that, you know, his career went to trash. But I, I actually read an article the other day, kind of kind of on what we're talking about here. I read an article the other day that said that uh, Twitter reported that 90, I don't want to lie, 93 or 94% of their verification requests come from Americans. There are just tons and tons and tons of Americans applying for verification badges from Twitter because they want those accolades and that attention of the blue badge, the popularity, whatever. And, uh, you know, that, that Twitter reported that a lot of the, the foreign blue badges they give out, they actually approach those people and give those mm -hmm. out. Um, and so I think that, I think that speaks to almost exactly what we're talking about here. It's, it's a really fascinating Andy Warhol oh, said so cool. it, you know, when he called that every in the future everybody's going to be famous for fifteen minutes. Now mm -hmm. it's like famous for a couple of couple of minutes or a couple of tweets, and, and anybody can be verified. I'm not verified on Instagram, and I've not even tried to become verified. Like it's it's something that um, I actually like that I'm not verified on Instagram. I'm verified on Twitter and Facebook and all that, but I'm I love that I'm not. I don't mm. want to be verified. I want to be unverified. Unverifiable. Unverifiable. <laughs> Here's a, an audience question for you, Kevin from Beecher says, as a creative person, how do you keep creating constantly uh, ever hit any dry spells and how do you push through? That's a great question. Um, yeah, it is a good question. Um, dry spells are, uh, you know, a problem for, you know, just about everybody. Um, I've not had a necessar necessarily a dry spell spell because I, I think I'm really interested in so many different things. I'm, I'm like a, 
I'm just a, a, a constantly curious person. Um, and so my curiosity leads me down a path and I continue to just kind of go where the muse calls me. I think the problem with a lot of other artists is they feel they've got to make something that uh, people are going to enjoy outside of themselves or that the industry is going to take seriously or they're, they're going to have to write a certain thing to be accepted on, on a label or a radio or whatever. And I look at things completely the opposite. Like if, if it's on a label, I don't want to listen to it most mm. of the time. You know, if it's on the radio, I don't listen to the radio. I mean, I listen to XM radio once in a while. I, I, I'm a fan of uh, First Wave because they play a lot of new wave artists. And then David Bowie just got a channel, Channel 14. Um, but nice. I don't listen to the radio. Uh, when, when I'm turning stations, country music, Christian music, pop music, rock music, it's all boring to me. Uh, mm. How about commercial worship music? Boring. With the same line repeated 20 times to really Maybe. bring you into the presence. Really boring. <laughs> <laughs> what presence are they being brought into? That presence has had to have walked away long. G, the, the ring being brought into the presence of G, C, D, and E minor in one of three different progressions. That's I mean, what yeah, I, I think that it's different for all sorts of people. Um, some people really relate to that and, and are in a place where they are enthralled by that melody or that repetition or whatever. Um, I think that I was just lucky in listening to really weird stuff growing up that I'm not, you know, interested in that. Like mm -hmm. the first time I heard modern worship music, I just thought, oh my God, really? That's what people are into. I mean, I, somebody has said this, and I think it's really interesting when DC Talks, DC Talk stopped making music, worship music happened. And um, mm. I think we were the reason we, we when we stopped, um, they had to create something, you know, that was going to sell on a certain level. And there you have, I, I don't know. I think I, I will say this uh, since since you, you know, kind of brought that up. I, I think. You know, Paul I was, was kidding, asking, I was kidding, by the way. DC talk did not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know that. You but I, will, I will say this. I will say this. You know, Paul said something about not having, you know, freedom inside the evangelical space. And, uh, and I could certainly see the limitations on that. But I will say that. And I don't know, maybe this is just, you know, generation bias or something. But I, I will say the music of DC talk, audio adrenaline you know, the, those bands in those days, uh, was a lot more original and creative than, than the canned evangelical music that we get today. Um, and so I do think you, you may be joking, but I do think with the, you know, with the, uh, uh, pause of DC talk, um, there was a pause on creativity in the evangelical space. I, 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 I disagree just because there were, well, let me just say this, Jeremy, because I feel like there was a whole subculture of music that was happening, you know, during the, the nineties, even up to the early two thousands, that was really interesting and, and largely alternative stuff that, you know, wasn't played on radio. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say a lot of tooth and nail type bands. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, you know, I, I think there's a lot of artists out there that were in a Christian mindset that were creating really interesting work, but that just weren't heard by people. They mm. just didn't have the platform to be played on or they, they weren't invited to the festival because nobody knew who they were. They didn't, they weren't, you know, savvy enough to approach a label or didn't have the right lyrical qualities to get them, you know, somewhere. So I feel like there is a lot of, things that people passed up on that they shouldn't have, you know? Well, I, do, would you say that the, that, that it was passed up on kind of more at the executive level? Cause I agree with you. I mean, I listened to, you know, we had like a local ska band who were here, here in Oklahoma that was Christian influence, you know, Sly's alter ego. I think about Reliant K Reliant K very creative band, um, early two thousands, you know, on into the 2010s. Um, but do you think that from the executive level, something changed, uh, you know, was there a reason that a lot of those artists were being passed up on? 
Uh, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I do think that um, they didn't know how to play the game really well, probably, and and they were largely ignored. Um, you know, I think that people that really, you know, <laughs> go out of their way to, you know, really become known uh, are the people that do become known. I think, I think the people that are uh, maybe isolated or, you know, have anxiety about, you know coming to a, an event where they're trying to search out the person that would listen to their demo tape, whatever. Um, you know, I will say this. I mean, when we first started out in the early, early nineties, I mean, we were on a tour in Europe um, with the 77s and Charlie Peacock and Res Band and a couple of the artists. And I remember <clears throat> watching the 77s for the first time thinking, man, this is like a really great new wave band. I mean, I didn't realize that, Christian music made stuff like this. And then yeah. Charlie Peacock trio got up and just blew me away. I was like, it was like the police, um, but with, you know, somebody singing like Smokey Robinson. And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, really interesting. It's intriguing that these people, you know, are in Christian music and they have a following because I'd never heard of them before. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I feel like there were probably a lot of different bands like the 77s or like Charlie Peacock. Or, you know, like the prayer chain um, or the choir that were kind of in the sidelines, you know, it, that didn't get the opportunities that those bands did. And, um, yeah. Well, I think about like Bono and The Edge who almost quit music because they felt like they needed to serve God. Um, how much as you too have they done to change the world in serving oh, God than stopping and doing something? Christian somewhere along yeah, the way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, I think U2 is a great example of, of, a, of a band that really knew how to market themselves too, though, you know, true mm. a way to, uh, you know, ingratiate themselves into certain circles and they got noticed and they were, they were, they were passionate about being on stage and becoming the next big band, you know, and they pushed themselves and they got there because of that. They, they met the limelight because they they were insatiable they had to be there you know what i mean and it's a lot of like hollywood stars i think same stories like a james dean you know um was obsessed with becoming an actor and he nobody knew who he was when he came to new york and he tried out for every you know crappy uh you know thing on tv to small theater productions that nobody had heard of and he just did so many of them and he became he soaked in the culture so much that he finally was noticed by somebody. And then they were like, you know, wow, I mean, there there's a there's a star in front of us, you know what I mean? And so yeah. that opportunity, um, a lot of people that don't go for it never get to seize that moment, but they're but they're there in the shadows and they're they're mm -hmm. there on the sidelines and they're there in the periphery. We just don't see them. And so I'm always interested in looking around to see what's out there that hasn't necessarily been thrown into the line. What what kept you um from I mean because let's talk about I mean like you went from probably the most well known uh Christian band in the world uh, to being a guy who cares about the things that are happening on the periphery and on the edge and, and great art and things that may not be in the mainstream. What kept you from being hungry just to stay in the center of the conversation? It bored me. Hmm. Mm. And I, for, for, for better or for worse, I started to kind of act out and, um, get in trouble and become the, the bad boy of Christian music or whatever, just because I got tired of playing the game. And so I would get up on stage for during Dev Award, you know, um, winning award after award after award. And I'd start make I'd start making fun of the awards on the show and people didn't really love it. You know, I love that. And uh, I was like, don't, you know, I was the guy there like, don't let that guy talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's in DC talk, but don't let him talk. Yeah. DC, yeah. yeah. Kevin, DC, you're DC shut up. Silent. DC, yeah. DC <laughs> silence, you know, but you know, I was, I was the singer. I wasn't the rapper. Thank God. But <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're going to let Toby talk now. Okay. <laughs> and Toby was good at talking. He was good right. at, you know, explaining how he felt in that time period. I, as a 20 something, I didn't even 
a lot of times I didn't even know where I was. I just kind of would stand back and go, what is this? And it just completely mystified me. And it kind of passed me by too. The, 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 I had a long talk with one of the other guys in one of the earlier groups that I was a part of. And, and they said, you know, you just always bothered us because, you know, you, you know, you always felt, you, you always thought that you were different and a misfit and you stood out and, and I, and, and we hated you for it. And I, and I said, you know, it's literally because that's how I felt. It mm -hmm. wasn't that I was trying to project some kind of misfit mm -hmm. thing. You know, and Toby always goes like, you were the Johnny Depp of the band, you know, you were, you know, like this, you know, outsider, whatever. And I'm like, it's because I was, I was listening to David Bowie and the Smiths and I was in a Christian rap band, you know, and right. I didn't know why, yeah. I, why, why I was there, but I made these friendships and we, and we, we, we toured quite a bit and we, we made quite a bit of music and um, I'm proud of a lot of it. Um yeah. And a lot of it I'm kind of, you know, at odds with now or whatever, but I don't look back on it with any regret because I'm, I'm always moving forward into what, what excites me and what, um, what uh, feeds my, you know, I'm like an insatiable worm that has to constantly <laughs> eat off the ground. And, and if I don't, if I don't get to the next point of creating something that's interesting to me, then I go nuts and people around me do not like to be around me when I'm like that. Well, and I'm sure being so like my, my dad is an evangelist. So I lo I saw tons of behind the scenes stuff in churches and I'm sure you guys even more got to see like behind the, the curtain of, the veil. of evangelicalism. Yes. And I'm, and I think it, that can be like, that's not going to make you, I don't know. I like just a reminder that the music Christian music industry is still a business at the end of the day. It was boring. I mean, when you when you see behind the veil to so many different things, the 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 the, the romance about uh, of it is gone, and mm -hmm. like the 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 um, it's, I think it's the same thing in, in in movie making. It's like you go into the first movie that you make thinking this is the most magical thing ever, and then you realize the work behind it, and then you realize all the the stuff that's just not glamorous that's attached. Yeah. To it. You know, so the the, the romance for that wore, wore off really quickly for me. Um, even to the point now where I'm not really into touring that much. I mean, uh, mm. forming that much. I, the love of being in front of a large crowd doesn't really um, interest me much mm. either. I mean, when I get the opportunities to do it because I've got to make money for my family and I've got to provide, then I do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not there because I want to be famous. I'm there because I'm, I'm doing a job. Right. Yeah. You are a true artist where your love is of the art. I think so. I mean, yeah. I know it sounds so cliche and it's like, oh, he thinks he's a true artist. <laughs> well, I think it. I so. should have like an ascot. Actually, I do have a bit of an ascot tonight. <laughs> um, well, yeah. And I, I, I'm a bit of an ass too. But, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a whole ass. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, I, but I think that shows, and I think it, it shows in the fact that you found boredom in the spotlight. I, I, so, you know, it may sound cliche to say it, but the actions speak for themselves. You know, I, I remember, you know, hearing tracks like early on before your solo career, hear, hearing tracks like, you know, Alas, My Love and things like that, that were, you know, a lot more deeper than the other things that we were getting mm -hmm. um, through those seasons. And, uh and going man kevin's on a different level and and and, and so I, I think that's been the beauty of your solo career is being able to see those things kind of expand and and for you to you know to to just try to test all those spaces and um i mean you know, like something like a, beautiful like salvador dali is an, another one of my favorite painters and you know he was destitute for a long time nobody knew who he was and um, people made fun of him and he was a misfit and he finally started pr making art that people recognized and got some opportunities and became Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. But um, he was always restless with creating as well. And he, he, he just didn't make sense to a lot of people, but I feel like as an artist, it's almost like my duty to not uh, make sense to everyone. Um mm -hmm. 
and I, I enjoy that. I don't even make sense to myself. So it, it, I think it, I think I am just naturally a person that likes to create. And yeah. I, I've been gifted with a voice that's interesting. It's peculiar. It's unique. And so I've been able to do a lot of things with my singing voice um, mm -hmm. that has given me a lot of uh, interest and intrigue by people. I call it the uh, mystery vibrato. I mean, your voice is amazing. Like, we're just going to say that. Like, you have a voice that I don't even, I don't know if there's an English word to describe it, how unique and just heavenly it is. Oh, April. How do you respond? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just, not to make it weird, but I love that. You know, thank I, you, God, for Kevin Max's voice. I, tr I try to sing as much as possible because I do know that I'm, I'm, that's what I'm kind of made for, but I'm narcissistic in the uh, point where I, I feel like I want to do more. Mm -hmm. And that's why I get out there and I create poetry and I create, create songs. Um, but honestly, I'd be happy singing for Disney or, um, you know, singing for Hamilton or being in theater or whatever. You I mean, should I should try out for Hamilton. I should, but I'm too old now. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> Ages of, no. no. Like, oh, I, I, hey, you know what we can do? We can go to a church and just rewrite all the lyrics of Hamilton. <laughs> no, we're absolutely not. And Kevin Max not can be. Gonna can, do that. <laughs> oh, that's so gross. That's Plagiarism what, is disgusting. <laughs> Y'all know that that actually happened, right? I'm not like. <laughs> no, that's yeah, not it's happened story. multiple times, not just once. It there was like homophobic. That several one church churches Texas. that have done it. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, as, as one of those people that always feels like I'm the, the kid in the emperor's new clothes story saying the emperor is naked. I appreciate your viewpoint a lot. Have you, have you been aware of other Christian celebs, if I can use that term, who have moved out into the ex-evangelical space, a, a John Steingart or Jennifer Knapp or somebody like that. And, and I, I don't know if you have any connection with that, but have you, have you felt their pain as you've watched that? I'm happy for them. I don't feel their pain. I, I think they're, they're on a, they're they're progressing they're on they're on a journey that they're processing their theology and i think it's mm -hmm. it's wonderful um a great friend of mine derek webb you know he's been fearless um i met derek at a coffee shop i didn't know who he was and i'm sitting in a coffee shop in east nashville and my uh computer um kept pulling up this name derek webb uh, i was on i kept getting his password by accident or something and I'm looking around, I'm like, hey, are you Derek Webb? Are you Derek Webb? <laughs> Finally, I met this guy and he was Derek Webb. And we started talking and he's like, oh, you're Kevin Max. And I'm like, yeah. And and um, we be we've become friends ever since. And it's amazing how he's, you know, he, Caveman's Call, I didn't know much about their music, um, but he's a great example of somebody that's been absolutely fearless about his, his, um, his progression, his journey and his creativity. And, um, you know, he's a hero of mine. I just, I just love what he's yeah. been doing. Um, and there's lots of folks out there that might not be as well known that are doing that as well. And I'm, 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 I'm so interested in them as well. They're all my heroes. Um, I think anybody that's willing to ask the big questions and not think everything is an answer is, is good in my book, you know? Yeah. We definitely want to be respectful of your time. And I want you to tell us about your Kickstarter and Winterwoods and all of that. But I just, I have to say this real quick, because I know that I'm sure you get some hate comments. We get lots of hate comments. Um, but I just want, I don't know if you realize when you tweeted a year ago that you were an ex-evangelical. Um, yeah, it's like people, it, it made waves. But like we talked about it on our show, how validating it felt for so many of us to mm -hmm. because for us like I grew up very evangelical and I've been constantly being like seeing people that I used to really respect and look up to mm -hmm. constantly demonizing my path demonizing where I'm at now and I know my heart and just to see someone that I really looked up to in the 90s and the early 2000s being that voice now and saying like, hey, it's okay, I'm one of you too. Like that, I don't know if you realize how meaningful that was for so many of us. And I, I hope that 
that can outweigh like the negative stuff. It does. Absolutely. When I see the negative stuff, I expect it. So when I see positive stuff, that's, that's what I really look for, you know, because that is the unexpected. Uh, as human beings, we feel better when we tear somebody else down. And I feel like that's um, one of the reasons that the aliens fly by and lock their doors because we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're reprehensible. And I, and I feel like, you know, instead of lifting somebody up for their differences, we want to tear someone down in, in, in it's instinctive. Right. And it's disgusting. I hate that uh, about humanity. Yeah. And, you know, I, it even wears me out when people come on my pages and start, you know, throwing their weight around on my page. And I've never visited their page once. And I've never said anything on their page. And it's amazing how entitled people are, too, hmm. in, in the, in the, in the inter, on the Internet. Because, again, I mean, these people would not say these things uh, face to face. Right. But no, of course like not. The Internet yeah. has been this huge thing that has you know devolved we're, we're, we're regressed now because of it uh, i agree and so i don't know how we get out of it i think we spend more time you know seeking after beauty than than trying to figure out how how the dopamine rush can affect us during the day or how we can be validated by people that don't really know really anything about us um but i don't know i don't know i don't yeah. know we get better it's probably not going to get better. It's just going to get worse. It's going to get yeah. worse. Well, well, tell us about your Kickstarter project. And for those who are with us, I put the uh, the link into the comments. We'll but... put it in the show notes of the podcast yeah. too. Um, it is called Winter Woods um, because I, I've been doing a show every year at the holiday season called Winter Woods. This will be the fifth year that I do it. But this year I decided to make a record. Um, my mother has dementia and the last um, lucid thing she said to me was, I want you to make me another Christmas record. And mm -hmm. I haven't made a Christmas record since 2004 because I'm not a huge fan of Christmas records. Um, again, I'm a, when, I, when Christmas comes around, I usually listen to the Smiths um, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and the Cure. But I will pull out Nat King Cole once in a while or Bing Crosby or whatever because um, I love them as vocalists. But the point is, is that I, I got to interrupt there, Kevin, say there's nothing at Christmas uh, like listening to if it's not love, then it's the bomb, the bomb, the bomb. Right. It brings <laughs> us together. Yeah. <laughs> Girlfriend in a coma. You know, it's perfect Christmas music. But I, I, I do speak in my language, brother. I think that, um, you know, I wanted to make this Christmas record that where she could recognize my voice. Um, but then I also could have fun making and I'm going back to really ancient carols that were mm. you know, maybe 15th century, 16th century. I know it's, it already sounds like a sting record. It's um, it's going to we're going to try to make these kind of gothic spooky choral s songs um, out of it. And hopefully I don't scare my mother um, because when you have dementia, <laughs> there's a lot of anxiety there. So, I mean, I could I could really miss the boat on this one. <laughs> Probably just hoping that I sing, you know, have yourself a Merry Christmas. Um, and, and I'm over here doing, you know, a gothic <laughs> version of Holly and the Ivy. You know? all, all I'm hearing, all I'm hearing is Christmas turns sting, you know, like <laughs> every breath you take, every move you no, make, no, Santa's no. watching you. <laughs> It would be more like Christmas goes Bauhaus um, yeah. <laughs> or Tim Burton. I love that. Ooh, nice. I love that. Nice. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's called Winter Woods. It's it's about 73% right now. Um, I think we we have two weeks left. And so anybody that is willing to put us over the edge, that would be wonderful. You get a download of one of my rock records called Fantasy right away. And it's an uh, album that I've taken songs from fantasy soundtracks that inspired me and gave me nostalgia as a kid. One of them was pure imagination. Willy Wonka um, mm. it was one of my first movies ever was Charlie and the chocolate factory. And it kind of stuck out in my mind and I decided I wanted to do pure imagination. And then it kind of spitballed from there. And I did a song from labyrinth and I did a song from last unicorn. And um, so the next, we, we want to do a trilogy of these things. And the next one we're doing is called horror. 
because mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of horror movies. And so I want, want to do soundtrack songs from horror films and then possibly drama. So then we could do a Hamilton song or, mm-hmm. or a song from Rent. You know what I mean? But uh, anyways, so check it out, Winter Woods. Um, if you can help us, that would be great. Uh, if not, um, it's cool too. I'm excited. Winter Woods could go along nicely with my favorite Christmas movies, which are Lord of the Rings, which I consider those Christmas movies. Absolutely. Harry Potter too. So yeah. I, I, I watch Harry po- Potter Goblet of Fire every Christmas. That's my Christmas movie. I love that. It is Christmas, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, in the, uh, I'm so excited for my kids to be old enough to watch uh, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. I made the mistake, though. My daughter's six, and uh, we were talking about I was watching the trailer for Rings of Power. This is a few weeks ago. And my daughter's like, what's that? I was like, oh, this is my this is a show based on mommy's favorite movies of all time. And I was like, you can't watch it, though, because there's scary monsters. And so she is a persuasive little one and convinced me that she could handle it. So I decided to show her a picture of Gollum just to be like. I felt like that was low level monster and she cried before she went to sleep and I had to lay next to her because she was so scared. It was like not my best parenting moment. So I know that I am nowhere near close to being able to watch them with her. But anyway, I wasn't expecting to share that story, but here we are. I love that story. I mean, my, <laughs> my kid got so scared when he saw, you know, Gollum bite off Frodo's finger. Um mm-hmm you know, the bloody stuff and the, the screaming. And he came in right at that scene. It was the first thing he ever saw of Lord of the Rings. And he, I think he was like, yeah, that's, that would be a bit much. And, and it, it scarred him. And so now I have to explain to him, okay, here it comes, you know, um, Gollum's going to jump up and, and fight with Frodo. So yeah, um, I've got a question. I mean, who do you think the stranger is on Rings of Power, April? I mean, do you have any ideas? Well, I know the fan theory of it being Gandalf. But I honestly don't know. I'm kind of like, I'm purposely not looking at the fan theories because I just want to enjoy the ride and be yeah. surprised. Um, but I don't know. I don't think it's Gandalf, though. No, I don't think it's Gandalf. It's Alatar, or it might even be Uru himself. But if it's Gandalf, it's kind of a letdown in my opinion. I feel, yeah, I feel like that's like too... I don't know. Two on I the nose. I have no idea what we were talking about right now. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, you have to come back. You have to come back sometime. We can just talk fantasy stuff because Paul and Jeremy don't. And anytime I bring it up, they look at me like I'm a weirdo, and I want them to know <laughs> they're I don't the weirdos. Think you're a weirdo. I find it endearing, <laughs> and I appreciate your hobbies, April. My don't hobbies. Put words in my mouth. <laughs> um, I, I have read Tolkien's books, and I have watched the trilogy, and the the third one was. An hour too long, but it was nope. one of the best movies nope. I've ever I seen for two another, hours. And, I could have watched another hour. And then I just wanted to get out of the theater. But movie, great movie scaring the shit out of kids is a long tradition. The flying <laughs> monkeys in Wizard of Oz and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, no, I, and the, the creepy uh, guys in, in the chocolate factory. Uh, I, I didn't sleep for months after those movies. Yeah, um, I watched the appendices. Uh, Lord of the Rings. I I, I watched the whole appendices. You know, <laughs> wow. I haven't even done that yet. You're the, better than me. You know, that's what's interesting is the behind the scenes, you know, you know, seeing all these orcs, got people taking off their orc makeup and having a conversation. Again, I don't know why I'm obsessed with this, but I just want to see orcs as every day. I mean, I want them to be portrayed as, as normal. They, uh, I want to know about orc restaurants because they clearly know what a menu is. Reach back on the menu, boys. So, like, what? Where are they? Where are these? Yeah, yeah. You know, they argue over things. They get really upset about roots, tree roots. No, like, what did the tree do to them? Their drinks seem like it's Jägermeister or something. You know what I mean? It's like like thick and dark, and I'd be interested in what kind of liquor that is. It's got to be a liquor. Yeah, I feel like that's the only thing about the in the Middle Earth. Well, my spouse and I were talking about this: the difference in Game of Thrones. Um like worldview and Lord of the Rings and in Lord of the Rings, it's more, it's more very clearly good versus evil. Like there is some, there's some differences, but like the orcs are just evil. Like Sauron, it's just bad. We're in game of Thrones. It's like, we're all a little evil and we're all a little good. I'm not (laughs) bored. I'm, I'm just lost. That's all. I have no idea what we're talking about at this point. I'm sorry. Beecher's like, you two could leave now. I could. Yeah. Somebody cares about you though, Jeremy. They they care about your, your feelings during this. It's really 
is really yeah. admirable. It's, it's like How about movie. Westworld? Do you do you like? Are you a Westworld guy? And I like um, Westworld. Uh, yeah, it wasn't my favorite, but I, I liked Westworld. Um, I think the best thing ever to appear on Netflix of all time um, is uh, Midnight Mass. Uh, mm. And mm -hmm. honestly, the story. Um, it's an episodic. It's 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 about a small Catholic church on an island, and it has to do with vampires. Uh, it's so good if you're deconstructing or an ex evangelical it's a deconstruction feast. It really is. I have an idea, <laughs> and I'm going to say this out loud right now. What if, for our evangelicalish community friends, we offer an episode of just April and Kevin <laughs> talking about all the fantasy things? <laughs> Yeah. Or, I, or how about how about we have a watch you party? You can't put him on the spot like this on a live. <laughs> oh no 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 no! I got a better idea. I got a better idea. How about a watch party like a, a mystery science theater three thousand no. thing? We do we do an episode of that and do uh, do like a paid online event and we donate the money to Kevin's project. Ooh. We well, would have, have to do to that be really like the fast. Next two weeks, yeah. <laughs> Well, y'all seem prepared. April, <laughs> April and I go back and forth on Twitter anyway, so we'll just we'll just have this conversation in subtext. As yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll take it we'll take it off the show because people are then I'm obviously really not going to have any idea what's happening because it's going to be like trying to follow the mess. Well, I, so, hey, Side I, Road, I, by the way, a, a great deconstructing show on on uh, streaming right now is Severance. If you haven't seen Severance, mm, and you want to see a show that's poignant about religion and shutting down the mind and thought and all that stuff. Severance is a great one. I think I can't wait for season two to come out. I also think D uh, game of Thrones house of the dragon is a deconstruction feast as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on there in the minds of the dragons. I mean, imagine being the, the actual yeah. dragon and having to, you know, be the epitome of the warrior that everybody's looking at you to, completely decimate the enemy and all the anxiety that that dragon must be feeling as like the number one object of war um mm -hmm. the dragons being objectified and and i'd like to hear more from the dragon's perspective like i agree you know we need a dragon, dragon. Yeah, yeah totally what are they I mean, doing they, in their they, home during they, the day right and they clearly have allegiances they do they, they listen to people so Okay, here's my question though. Final question, and then we, and then we can leave you. Which show are you enjoying more right now, House of the Dragon or Rings of Power? I wish that that we could put them together, like Wizard of Oz and you know Pink Floyd, um, uh, Dark Side of the Moon, and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> an amalgamation of both things hmm. would be interesting to me. If I had to choose. Just gut choice. It's gonna it's gonna be Rings of Power because I I grew up on Tolkien. Um, yeah, it's, it's completely nostalgic. George R. R. Martin is a genius, but um, I feel like he just kind of you know because he's not finished the story. Right. Many people are putting different ideas together that might not be a hundred percent in. Well, like, is House of the Dragon? Is it based on his? I know it's based on the world that he created, but it's it's not based on any actual books, is it, or is it not based on a book? But I think that it, he is involved in in, in the show story. running. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, Rings of Power. I'm a fan. I think Rings of Power. Was I'm I'm amazing. so excited. I kind of wish it was spaced out though, because I'm gonna get like my fantasy fix like all at once, and then I'm gonna go like a year, just bleh, waiting again. <laughs> Um, but Paul and Jeremy look so bored. So, We're so. not bored. Like, you're you're like, just staring like I don't know what y'all are talking. About. No, I'm I'm just I'm gonna be maligned by your crowd now because I've, <laughs> I've you know gone down this fantasy sci-fi trail with April and everybody that doesn't like that feels left out. No, no, no. All that they, they all love it. I I am the weird one here. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm I'm the odd one. I've seen no comments to 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 the positive uh, side of this yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> silence from your crowd oh that's true beecher says we have the witcher in winter so the that'll witcher, amazing i love the witcher too i love the witcher too yeah. we it have hocus, we have hocus pocus 2 on uh, disney when is that is that coming out this halloween it's coming out in the next probably month i think yeah Ooh. Yeah. see that's a movie i remember watching hocus pocus as a kid and i was like maybe my girls can watch it but i'm i feel like there's probably parts in it that 
are scarier than I remember. We, we just let our seven year old, or well, she's eight now, but we let her watch it last Halloween and she did okay with it. Okay, well, it's um, good to know. So, well, can, can, can we stop making Halloween movies though, please? <laughs> can Can Jamie Lee Curtis just stop making Halloween movies? You know, Halloween was the original was one of the great horror films of all time. And now it's just freaking stupid. It's stupid that they're still making it and it ruins the original when they do that. So again, I, I think they should, they should spend a little bit of time going by, you know, developing the character of the shape. You know, when we find out what he's eating during the day and, and how he's spending his time, you know, locked in that <laughs> old house of his, you know, imagine like what must be going through his mind before he has to put the mask on and walk around. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to hear what he's going through. You know, I yeah. love you. He's got to have feelings too. He's right? got to have feelings. You know, I think it's telling, I don't know <laughs> when I used to watch Sesame street as a child, my favorite character was Oscar. And it really concerned my mom <laughs> because he's like the bully. I was like, no, he's just misunderstood. So I love that you're like, we need to hear from the. I had a shirt like Oscar. I love the the kind of terry cloth green, slightly large hanging things off of the terry cloth. I wanted to. I had a shirt that looked like Oscar, and I and mm. I love. It. And I, I think love it was that like a tennis tennis brand, but. Mm. Uh, you know, that's why I was drawn to Oscar. I also liked that he was kind of crazy. I liked the the drummer, um, the animal. I really yeah. Ooh, yeah. Kevin Beecher just said a good idea that you should write a villain's album where each of the songs tells the other side of famous movies. That's what I've been doing for my whole solo career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next record we're making is called Horror, and we will do that. We will kind That's of dig, dig in. One of the first ones we decided on was uh, Cry Little Sister from um, The Lost Boys, uh, mm. which was another great vampire film. Mm. What's yeah. your favorite horror movie? Of all time? Yeah. So hard. I mean, you know, for me, it was The Shining uh, mm. because it was so iconic. Uh, but I also love um, I also love The Exorcist. I love Rosemary's Baby. Mm. Um, I loved Her Hereditary, the thing that just came out. I thought that was great. Have I didn't see that one. Hereditary? No, I I don't love horror movies. I watch one every year because it was the deal I made with my spouse that we'd watch one for Halloween. What about your spouse? Does he like horror? The, the um, I don't know that they really like it, but um, it's it, they they like good film because so we're filmmakers so they like good stories so if if the if the movie is a good story we can handle the the so horror they, to it so they need to watch Mandy uh, oh, is the, with the uh, Nicolas Cage yeah <laughs> I think they wanted to watch that last year and we didn't last it's, year we, well what's your, what's your spouse's name again Beecher okay. Uh, Mandy needs to be uh, like just something you guys watch together. It's 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 amazing. It, okay. it's, it's a well, great ho horror film. It doesn't get as much attention as it should have. And Panos Cosmodos is my favorite director. He made another great one called Beyond the Black Rainbow, which is another really weird horror film that you should watch too. But okay, I'm weird, yeah. so maybe you might not. No, Beecher's Beecher's you know. been asking me to watch Mandy for a while, and I I'm weird. Like I don't like horror, but then. So thank you. We watched that. What was what was that show on Netflix that came out a couple years ago of Halloween? Um, Hill House, Haunting at yes. Hill House. I like that too. Yeah, we watched that, and Beecher's that it was too scary for them. So I finished it by myself. Okay. So it's like, but I didn't want to watch it. They had to force me to watch it, and then I ended up liking it. So I don't know. I got to deconstruct well, something with horror films. I think. Well, you need to come over to my house, and I'll we'll, we'll watch a couple of horror films that I think are really great, and then. We'll have a discussion afterwards. And sounds uh, great. We can we can do a podcast about it and just geek out. Make a <laughs> well, you're gonna be in Nashville in just a few weeks here, April. So you guys can work it out. Hey, thank you so much, everyone, for inviting me. Um, yeah. And uh I man, I really love this. I'm I really put the pause on podcasts for a long time just because I saw everybody and their sister talking about me. And mm. I thought it was very interesting. I thought it was funny actually. I loved seeing how many people would make a podcast on, you know, my one tweet uh, without <laughs> going up to talk about it. And my friend David Dark was like, just see how long you can go without being on a podcast and <laughs> telling people how you really feel. 
you know, and I, and I let it go for a while. So this was probably my, my third podcast that I've done and it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for what an taking honor. the time to be with us and keep doing what you're doing. You are outside of just the artists. Like we love, I love hearing just your thoughts on the universe too. So, okay. and Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth and Dungeons and Dragons and all that stuff too. <laughs> well, we appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. We are super grateful uh, for Kevin taking time to spend with us this evening. Uh, if you liked the episode, uh, definitely go give us five stars, especially on Amazon or uh, I'm sorry, on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and uh, let people know why they should listen. And on uh, Saturday, October 1st, we're going to be in Nashville. You can sign up at evangelicalish.com for the event and you can also join the evangelicalish community there and get some behind the scenes stuff as well so anyway thank you so much for tuning in we love y'all it was a long episode we didn't even run our mid-roll but you know it's not every day you get to talk to the one the only uh kevin max so for april and paul and kevin i'm jeremy thank you so much for tuning in tonight and we will see you next week thank you guys all right, all.